Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, Mark and Michael, to this follow-up Q&A session on the Framing Masculinities webinar. Um, first, I just wanted to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the custodians of the land where I'm sitting today, and to also acknowledge the traditional custodians where you are both sitting and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of this country. So we spoke last week um, on the Framing Masculinities webinar, and we heard from you both about the various pieces of research and what um, that means for the work that we all do around gender equality and, and masculinities work. And there were over 600 people registered to that webinar, and there were so many questions that we couldn't get through it in the time that we had. Um, and so we're here today to really do a follow-up and try and get through as many of those questions as we can that were asked on Slido um, from you. And uh, yeah, use this as another opportunity to really explore some of these really important issues um, that you've both been working on. So thank you for joining us again. You're welcome. That's welcome. I, hope, I don't think I need to introduce you again, um, but maybe you could in detail, but maybe just uh, your name and where you're working would be great. Mark, you want to start? Sure, so I'm, I'm Mark Chenery. I'm the co-founder and director of Common Cause uh, and, uh, and led this research. And Michael? Um, so uh, Dr. Michael Flood, I'm a researcher at the Queensland University of Technology. Great, thank you. Um, so let's get into it. First, we might try and unpack some of the research. There were a few questions more on the research kind of methodology and things like that. So I thought I might start there. Um, so the question is, can you pre briefly describe the sampling frame and the sample size is sort of related to the methods of that research? So just a snapshot for the technical people out there. For the techie people who always intimidate me on, on calls like this, yes, so uh, the, uh, the methodology we used was an online survey um, of a nationally representative sample of people. It was in the end just over 1,600 people that we surveyed from around Australia, uh, nationally representative of age, uh, uh, binary genders and uh, of location, so we looked at metro rural as well. Um, and included within that was because we were interested in exploring how younger Australians might be thinking and talking about this issue. We looked at, uh, I think it was around just over 300, uh, 16 and 17 year olds through the survey as well. Okay, great. Um, so does the research also then, you know, we talked a lot last time about the, the messages and discourse and language analysis. Does the research and messaging also apply to the use of images? Yep, absolutely. So this, uh, our focus in cognitive framing is really about what are the ideas that we want to be activating in people's minds and then uh, a, a lot of the focus is what are the words and phrases that bring those ideas to life or activate those ideas in people's minds and, you know, a picture says a thousand words or potentially a lot more um, and so imagery is absolutely crucial. So everything that we've recommended in the guide would absolutely apply to um, imagery as well. So, um, for example, some of the recommendations is, is in the guide is just not to pander to okay. those old uh, sort of outdated stereotypes of men. And so that would apply in the way that we think about imagery, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, the sort of those old tropes and so on. And the, another recommendation is about social norming. So showing what it is that, uh, what, that we want and implying that the majority of people agree. So making sure that we're using that imagery. And typically that would mean more solutions focused imagery right. than yeah. problem focused imagery. You know, show people mm -hmm. a vision of, of what, what it should be like as opposed to what it isn't at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Michael, did you have any other tips about what this means for imagery and how we use it? It's, it's actually a question rather than a tip. So, I mean, I remember reading some of the research about social marketing aimed at men and trying to engage men to be bystanders, to, to be active bystanders, to speak up in response to other men's sexism and violence and so on. And one of the things emphasised in that research was the need for self-identification, for the target audience to recognise themselves mm -hmm. in the men, for example, shown in the posters or imagery, to, to feel a sense of identification with or familiarity with. 
the people shown in the posters so they could imagine themselves in that situation behaving in that way. Is that, I mean, is that social marketing 101? Is that part of what we need to do as well? Yeah, and I, I, that's actually an excellent point. And it is one of, the, one of the things to think about is that, but that would be audience specific. So our recommendations are general in nature in, in terms of if you're engaging with men or women, these are some general concepts and ideas we want to activate. And I think it comes more down to where I think about messenger uh, and the importance of messenger and we need to trust the people that we're engaging with. Um, and so it, it's a question of um, being able to see yourself in the, in the image, if we are showing imagery of, of people, for example, but then people have multiple identities. They're not just a man or a woman. Uh, they are soccer players or they're footy players or um, cricket players and so on. So it is about thinking about how do I create that connection with my audience without necessarily relying on the tropes, um, without, the, without using the stereotypes. Are there other ways that I can connect and show that this is a person like you and you know, it should be relatable. Yeah. A, a trope is a story, isn't it? A trope, a, a sort of narrative or a story. Yeah, just the, the, the old ways that we, the, 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 the stories that we've repeated so many times that they're a bit, they're a bit old, uh, a, bit, a bit of a hack, yeah. Great, very useful. Um, just remembering back, we were talking in the research about um, sort of there was the weak um, or more easily persuadable group. I'm not, remind me, Mark, the language that you use around yep. that. Yeah, persuadables, yeah. Persuadables. Um, there were, were there also supporters who were identified as being weak or persuadable in the other direction or persuaded by anti-feminist messaging? No. So, um, and, I, and I even had a, another sort of close look at this again, and it's not the case. So what was really interesting in this and, and heartening is the fact that our supporters are true supporters. So when you see uh, that, that group of people, that is, those are people who do, are not persuaded at all by the opposition message and for the most part are quite turned off by that message. So they act, um, react angrily against it. I mean, the one, um, the one sort of possible exception to that is that they are, not quite as strong on their belief that um, masculinity and femininity are socially constructed. They majority agree with that, but it's not quite as strong as we'd love it to be. But that's, that was one of the one things that sort of weakened them to a point that I, they weren't sort of our, our true supporters all the way. Um, but they still reacted the way supporters do, and that is that they showed the strongest level of support of any group for, for that statement, that, that it was socially constructed as opposed to biological. Well, that's quite good news, and isn't mm. it? Yeah, well, the opposition is weak. Our supporters are strong. Uh, you can't ask for better than that. Uh, among the supporters, they were they were twenty five percent of the. Po sorry, among the opposition, they were twenty five percent of the um, population, as I recall. They were, but, yeah. but eight percent of the population overall were what the report calls the hard opposition. Mm -hmm. So that means there was a greater segmentation among the opposition than among the supporters. Is that right? Yeah, so from memory, it's 26% was the opposition. Um, right. And then we had to narrow that down to 8% to find that hard opposition. Whereas we never had to do that process with the supporters. So if you wanted to really compare like for like, you've got 8% uh, real opposition and you've got 25% real supporters. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Good. Well, um, Michael, there was a question about... Um, you know, what, what does the, the research say, or it might not be this specific research or research more broadly about what actually influences um, our attitudes and perspectives as humans, men, women, um, gender diverse people, and in all our diversity, I guess. What, what do you know or what does the evidence say about what are the most sort of influential groups of, of people or, or systems that, that, sh that shape our attitudes? There's two things to say. One is that we certainly know that the influences on people's attitudes are uh, diverse and kind of multi-level. So, you know, one important influence on people's attitudes are their peers. Um, so for young men, for example, we know that a particularly important source of influence on their attitudes towards masculinity is their peers' attitudes, or more precisely, what they believe their peer, peers' attitudes to be. Um, another influence, obviously, is parents and family socialisation, we know that popular culture and media influences. We know that the cultures and norms of particular settings like um, your sport, your faith community, your, your workplace, all are influential. 
But on the, the kind of second question is, well, what's most influential? And that that is much harder to tell. It's much harder to tell what are the most significant sources of influence. And of course, you know, any, any individual will will um, receive different kinds of messages from different sources. Sources. So a young man may be getting messages about, you know, sexism, for example, from his mates. May be getting messages of um, uh, respect and tolerance from his school, maybe getting messages about traditional gender roles from his faith community, you know, who knows? So quantifying the influence of different, um, uh, different sources of attitudes is difficult, but we do know that they seem to differ for men and women. So for example, um, the policing of masculinity, the kind of people's efforts to sustain traditional or stereotypical ideas about masculinity come more from men than from women. And this research showed that, you know, as, mu as virtually all research does, that men's attitudes towards gender were more conservative. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the policing of gender, the policing particularly of masculinity, while it does come from women and girls, it comes more from men and boys. And that can mean it's particularly important to engage men and boys as sources of more positive or healthy messages about masculinity. Yeah, very interesting. So they're influencing, yeah, it's interesting to think about the influencing both directions you're you're influencing them around a particular model but then if they uh, step outside of that then there's the policing of that as well and I guess that's, that's yeah, yeah that's right is there just sort of following up you you talked about is peers attitudes or what people think their peers attitudes are which is a really interesting distinction how what does that mean in terms of of the work is it communicating that actually maybe peers attitudes aren't what you think they are or indeed so so there's an important stream of communications work in violence prevention in work on gender um, which which uses what's called a social norms approach and it starts from the insight exactly as you've described that people often overestimate other people's agreement with unhealthy or antisocial norms um, or their participation in antisocial or unhealthy behaviours, and they underestimate other people's support for healthier or more positive norms and ways of being. And we know from research among men, for example, that men often overestimate other men's support for or tolerance of domestic and sexual violence or their agreement with sexist attitudes. So a social norms approach tries to close that gap to address that misperception of other people's attitudes and behaviours using social norms campaigns. And social norms campaigns, for example, might survey a population in a particular setting, like a university, for example, to show that, in fact, 80% of young men agree that rape is never okay, or, you know, 60% of young people would never do X or Y. And so, in other words, to alert people to the reality of um, actual patterns of belief, and that addresses... Um, uh, a sense of pluralistic ignorance, that is the sense that other people um, don't agree with what you agree with. And second, it addresses that minority of people who believe in violence and sexism and so on, who think that everyone else thinks the same way and shows them that in fact, they're in the minority. So social norms campaigns are one way of, um, I suppose, building you know, more pro-social and healthy social norms in a community. Interesting, yeah, great. Um, there was also this sort of discussion around um, this, the opposition group and particularly that sort of hard opposition group that, um, that you identified, Mark. And um, I remember that, that, it was, that it was quite interesting how you were talking about actually we do, you know, alienating that group is not a bad thing because um, they're not going to change their views and we don't want to pander to them and we do sort of that that is kind of um, part of the messaging uh, the question the question is is there actually any risk in in triggering that that hard opposition group if their reaction might actually be to um, you know perpetrate violence or kind of um, act out or you know forms of backlash that that are hurtful and damaging and harmful. Mm. Uh, that's such a fascinating um, and good question. And I'm definitely going to ask Michael to pitch in as well on this one. Um, from, a, from a research perspective, what we're, what we're looking for is confirmation that our messages are actually tapping into a progressive feminist perspective. And the way that we're testing whether that is happening is what happens both to 
our supporters? Are they loving the message? Um, but also what's happening to the opposition who is just so, so hard in their opposition against that and react so strongly to those progressive messages. So it's not that, that we want to alienate the opposition, it's just that we use that as a measure of have we actually tapped into something progressive here. Um, and actually in this research, one of the things that was one of the things that we were really um, thinking about from very early on is that we can't just run a typical political advocacy campaign here in, in terms of what we're, what we're looking for in the messaging, because some of the people that we want to be engaged with here are the very people who might react the most against the message. And so we definitely were attempting to craft messages that were carrying a truly progressive story, yet wouldn't um, un unnecessarily antagonise um, men and men who might hold uh, strongly sort of traditionally masculine views. So that was something that we were very concerned about there. But I think there is a, an interesting tension there in terms of identifying those progressive messages, which are going to, by their nature, um, aggravate people who hold very, very different and very fixed views. Um, but then that, that concern around what that might do in terms of actually uh, yeah, encouraging violence or sort of pushing people into that. Yeah. I've got a comment too, but I wanted to ask you, you very carefully said unnecessarily antagonise. And so there's some sense there that some degree of antagonism it may not be desirable, but is inevitable and is is kind of, um, we can, it's okay because the, the overall impact of the, of the message will be positive. Yes, and it, I mean, that's just, just bringing us back to that conversation earlier about needing to narrow that opposition down from the original 26 to the 8% is what we were finding is that our messages are actually really appealing, <laughs> appealing way too much to uh, the opposition who otherwise might be attracted to those sort of regressive um, anti-feminist messages. So in, in many ways, we achieved what I would have thought was almost a little bit impossible in terms of actually messages that work really well across the board, but at the same time told our progressive story. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's definitely a case of, um, I, d I don't know how you avoid, uh, yeah, antagonizing people who are so dead against what is uh, a progressive story. I mean, some of the things that we looked at and that we used as red flags was, for example, one of the, one of the statements we, we included was, there are many ways to be a man and we haven't actually recommended that people use that messaging in, in, in the future in our guide, um, in part because it reinforces the importance of being a man when what we're trying to say is, you know, ideally we shouldn't be thinking about ourselves in terms of men and women, therefore how should we behave? Um, but also because that was one of the messages, one of the few messages which we thought might be okay, but which actually are the hard opposition quite agreed to, to a, to a degree that made me think this, it's clearly not saying to them a progressive message. And if it's not saying a progressive message to them, then we don't know for sure that it's actually saying a progressive message to the persuadables. And that's the, that's the real reason why we look at that and, and we think about sort of how they're responding. I mean, Michael, you've done quite a bit around of work around backlash. Is there anything you would add around how, how far we push and mitigate and what's that balance in, in that space? Look, it, it's certainly possible to do harm and there are evaluations of some violence prevention campaigns involving communications and other strategies as well, where the overall impact has been negative rather than positive, where in fact, for example, boys and men who saw the program, their attitudes overall moved in a negative direction. And certainly, you know, I think this research um, fleshes that out. It shows that some ways of appealing or trying to appeal to um, uh, men and women around gender will make things worse, that they will entrench an opposition, they will intensify people's regressive attitudes, or they may prompt backlash, particularly if, for example, um, large numbers of the men uh, who are in the audience interpret that message as anti-male and so on. At the same time, um, we can't work so hard to avoid any kind of resistance or backlash that we end up failing to address the problems of sexism and violence that we seek to address. Um, and the same is true around campaigns specifically on violence aimed at perpetrators, for example. There are good and bad examples of communications campaigns aimed at male perpetrators or potential perpetrators of violence. One of the best ones um, from the international literature is here in Australia called Freedom From Fear, which was a West Australian campaign 
aimed at men who were using violence or at risk of using violence. And one of, the reasons, one of the reasons that campaign was good was they really worked hard to test their messages beforehand. And they found that appealing to men in terms of the potential impact of their violence on children was a much more persuasive appeal than appealing to them in terms of the impact, somewhat depressingly, of the impact on the women themselves. And that and other evaluations have found that some ways of trying to appeal to perpetrators actually make the problem worse. They can make victims who see the message, for example, um, feel blamed or feel like the perpetrator himself is not accountable for his behaviour. Um, appeals that try to threaten men with jail, for example, or threaten men with illegal consequences can, consequences can fall flat either because they were unrealistic, given that the vast majority of men never you know, see the inside of jail after perpetrating violence, or because they just prompt shame and blame, and that's not helpful for behaviour change. And so from, from some recent reviews of efforts to engage perpetrators, for example, um, there's a delicate balance we have to um, steer between push and pull. Push, um, push appeals are, you know, the negative impact of your behaviour on children or the negative ways in, the, in which you'll be seen by children or your ex-partner or people around you. We have to balance those with pull appeals, the, the positive value of being a good parent, a good partner, um, appealing to um, men who've used violence, their preferred ways of how they're seen by others appealing to non-violence as the right thing to do and so on. Mm -hmm. So while there are no easy answers, I think kind of delicately treading that balance between push and pull is part of this work. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. It definitely made me think <laughs> you said a bit about them caring less about the impact on, on women. Definitely made me, um, I don't know what the right word is, it definitely had a visceral <laughs> reaction to me. <laughs> In not it was depressing. Way. It was a depressing finding, really. Yeah. But, you know, pragmatically, I mean, this campaign was aimed at getting those men to ring a phone line, to getting those men to ring a phone line so that they would refer themselves or be referred to behaviour change programs. And the most effective way to do that turned out to be, as I've said, um, you know, messages to do with harms to their children. So the TV yeah. campaign that was produced showed a man being verbally abusive to his wife, who's in the front seat of the car, and the child is cowering in the back, um, you know, feeling afraid, feeling um, uh, all, all kinds of things to do with how her dad is treating her mother. Mm. And that proved more effective at getting those men, men like that, to ring a phone line and other appeals, even though politically, ethically, we might want men to care at least as much about the impact on the victim herself. Yeah, it may, there's a, you know, there was a question I was going to ask you later, but it makes me feel like this is relevant now, is this question about there was, you know, a few people had around, we are talking about trying to kind of reframe language to be positive and aspirational and appeal, figure out what appeals to, to men themselves that change behaviour and makes them rethink kind of ideas about, um, about stereotypes, which is obviously, you know, great. <laughs> But I think people, some people wonder, how do we do that sort of positive, aspirational, make men feel good about themselves kind of work at the same time as holding them accountable for harmful behaviour? And, and at the same time, in a way, keeping this work accountable to women and girls and keeping this work accountable to the feminist movement. And I know there's no easy answer, but I, I would love to hear, you know, both of your thoughts, I guess, on that. I don't know, Mike, would you want to start? Yeah, um, I mean, I don't have a rehearsed answer to this, but it seems to me whatever work we do to shift norms of masculinity or to foster healthier masculinities has to have some kind of ethical or political bedrock. It has to be driven fundamentally by a, a commitment to gender equality. And that does mean naming clearly the behaviours, the attitudes that we see as harmful, as unethical, and holding men to account for those, that doesn't mean that the language on the poster says, you know, stop being such a perpetrator. That may be less effective than other appeals. It's likely to be less effective than other appeals. But it has to be guided by an absolute commitment to addressing um, men's use of violence or men's involvements in sexist inequalities and, you know, trying to bring men to more ethical and equitable and nonviolent ways of being. Um, so I suppose I've distinguished between the kind of the feminist foundations of the, our work and campaigns and the specific language we use. At the same time, obviously, they're related. And, 
it's clear from you know experience over the last few decades that some messaging to men has done harm and does more harm than good appealing to real men for example or using only you know appealing to real men on the one hand appealing to very traditional ideas of masculinity can actually entrench the very norms of masculinity we're trying to shift mm -hmm. on the other hand appealing to men in terms of you know, don't rape women because you'll be locked up. That was a sort of, you know, a campaign I can think of in the UK that showed, that was trying to get, you know, trying to get men to not rape women. And it did so by threatening men essentially with rape themselves. You'll go to jail and you'll be raped by other men. Now, you know, to me that seems unethical and the, and the campaign itself was ineffective in terms of mobilising men to care about the issue or to think critically about their own sexually coercive behaviour, which at the end of the day was, you know, really what we should be seeking to do so guided by sort of fundamental feminist principles um, developed in partnership with women and women's organizations um, tested messages and appeals have to be tested for impact not only among their target audience but among others who might see them yeah off the top of my head i think there's some of the ways to make it more likely that we're doing good yeah absolutely no that's very useful because there's some tangible kind of steps that you can see that these are the ways you maintain that accountability um, Mark, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Just to say that that is, a, that is a core principle of the way in which we think about our work. We don't just look at what is an effective message. So mm -hmm. definition of that being, does it work for the exact thing we're trying to achieve right now, but is it also useful? Is it also going to contribute to the sort of longer term and broader change that we're trying to achieve here? And so that's why, even though this uh, particular piece of research was focused on masculinity and men and getting men to and 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 women as well and others to become more open to the idea of of, of moving on from from gender stereotypes um, we also explored other questions uh, around gender equality and, we, and and people's perceptions of whether men or women are more advantaged by our current system and so on because the last thing we wanted to do is create messages that engage with men really brilliantly around masculinity but then made them feel like somehow they were the ones hard done by by the status quo um, and that was absolutely not the case with, in terms of the, the, what we test and what we found is that this messaging actually had both the effect of substantially increasing people's beliefs that um, we need to move on from gender stereotypes, that they harm men, they harm women, um, but also the fact that gender equality is important and that women uh, and, and girls do suffer more than men and boys under the, under the current status quo. So that was... Um, that was something we were hoping for, but also really pleased to see because, yeah, there's no point doing effective messaging that then undermines everything else we're trying to achieve. Um, Emma, I mean, I know you're, you're sort of um, being the facilitator here, but can I ask you, as someone with a you know, wealth of insight and expertise in this area, what are your concerns or, you know, about this work and sort of appeal, you know, effort, efforts to shift norms of masculinity or to build healthy masculinity and um, so on? Well, you're putting me on the spot now, aren't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> but I, look, I'm, in some ways, I think, you know, the ethics of the work is to do, to do work that has an impact. You know, we're, we're doing this to create change in the world. We're not doing it for the sake of, you know, nice research. And so um, fundamentally, things that work, I, I think, matter. And so I, am, I lean towards you know, that careful kind of, um, like you were saying, having these principles that, that inform everything we do. And I think also ways of working. I think we've been talking, you know, certainly we've been doing a lot of work um, around men's accountability to the women's movement in, in this type of work and, and thinking through the actual tangible things that are required for accountability. And though some of the things you mentioned, the key, you know, the kind of, actual co-creation with and the engagement with and the diversity of engagement not just sort of tokenistic um, engagement with 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 women's groups I think that's that's absolutely key and and kind of um, kind of continuing to center women and girls voices in that but I am fundamentally committed to trying to create and support things that actually work and I th and I guess the last thing I would say is it's there's lots of different groups we're trying to work with. And in some cases, it might seem like a less progressive message, perhaps, or a message that is more, um, that, that tailors to a certain audience in a certain way. 
but that doesn't mean in other spaces we can't be we shouldn't be pushing a much more politicized um, explicitly intersectional feminist agenda and so I feel like we we need to do both so I think there's you know structural and system systematic changes that we can make that do need to be much more radical at the same time as we are doing work that appeals to men in the sort of persuadable men so for me it's it's making sure we continue to do both I guess I would say but so yeah now I'm supposed to be asking you the question <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the next sort of, there was a couple of questions, so we've only got a couple more left, but they're really more about what are the implications for programming and messaging. So um, what, what do we do now in terms of we've got this information and what does it mean in terms of the actual men's behaviour change programs? How do we frame them? Does it mean something for facilitation and delivery? Um, what's the next, you know, so what? What's next, I guess? Um, Mark, did you want to start? Yeah, I feel like we've sort of um, covered it a little bit with, with the conversations that we've been having now and, and in, the, in the session uh, last time, but um, really thinking about, for example, what this looks like in, in behaviour change programs, um, it is about ensuring that in the way that we talk about the issue, we are, we are putting men in the picture and that there's a clear role for them in terms of what what behaviours we want to see more of and what behaviours we want to see less of, um, but in a way that isn't, isn't creating judgement and shame, which then just leads to defensiveness and therefore lack of change. Um, and so that's where I, I think that the stereotype framing is helpful because it enables people to see the way in which their external environment is influencing the way in which they have been behaving. It encourages them to unpack assumptions um, to not just assume, it encourages them to, uh, it gives them the, the, the option of seeing their change as not just uh, something that is on them alone, but as something that our society needs to go through and they can be part of that. So it is about, it, it really is about freeing men from these stereotypes. Um, but once you know that it's a stereotype and once you know that the harm it causes to you and to others, there is an onus on you to then act in line with that. So I don't think it excuses men and their choices and, and the, the way they behave just by saying that there are some external systemic things going on that are influencing you. Um, once you see that, there is an obligation to then act on that. Um, and I think that can all be contained within there. But yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd love to to sort of think about that in more depth and work with people who are working in that space to think about sort of where this works and where it doesn't and what are the, what are the nuances that we need to think about. But, yeah. I'm, I'm sure Michael has some good thoughts on this too, yeah. Uh, look, nothing uh, I'm particularly more to add. I mean, I just think that in terms of crafting messages that will shift norms of masculinity, there's that general sort of communications challenge of getting the right message and getting the message right. So in other words, you know, what, what message will motivate change? What message will appeal to the, the target audience and, you know, motivate them to take whatever action we have in mind? And then what are the effective ways to communicate that? What, um, what imagery, what people, what language and so on will do that? Um, and, you know, I, what, one of the things I think is, the thing I think is so important about the Framing Masculinity Message Guide is precisely its practical guidance in doing that. Absolutely. One final question um, before we finish up. Um, we've spoken a lot, obviously, about masculine stereotypes and even a little bit last time about feminine stere femininity and feminine stereotypes, men and women. But the question is, how do we do this work without getting into binaries? And where do gender non-binary people and people of diverse gender identities fit into this discussion? I'll take that one. Um, I mean, I think it's absolutely important to recognise the diversity of ways of, of you know, being um, and doing gender out in the world and to recognise that, uh, you know, the world is, isn't simply divided into two categories of people, men and women or males and females. Um, at the same time, ours is a deeply gendered world and um, there are meanings attached to, um, you know, uh, being men and women and and the lives of men and women and, and others are organised in powerful ways by gender. So while we have to recognise that, pe that um, people live outside or question gender binaries, we also have to recognise the kind of powerful forms of 
um, the, the way in which our society is still organized in powerful gendered terms. One of the things I was encouraged by in the, in the data from the survey was that there was a relative degree of openness to kind of de-gendered standards of what mm. makes a good person, you know, um, appealing to people in terms of being a good person as opposed to a real man. There was, there was a fair amount of um, interest in that. And I think part of our work with men in particular um, has to be uh, encouraging their disinvestment in mm. manhood, their kind of investment in, no, I'm a real man and I have to be seen as a man and behave as real men do. Because that, that clearly feeds into, I think, some men's um, commitments to sexism and violence and their um, kind of hostile and defensive responses to challenges to that. So we actually need to diminish the gender binary and mm. people's investment in that binary at the same time as recognising that it's still a powerful feature of, um, you know, uh, everyday life. Mm. Thanks, yeah. Mark, any additional thoughts to that? Just a, just a quick one that... Um, in our research, for example, we looked at a few different sort of split sample questions in which we framed the question either in a more gender neutral way or we talked mm -hmm. about gender. Uh, so, for example, we asked people whether they agreed that boys just need good role models and it doesn't matter what their gender is. And the, um, the other half of the sample received the same statement again, but this time it said boys need both men and women as role models. Um, and unfortunately, what we, saw, what we saw is there was a significant increase in the number of people who supported the latter statement once we put those, once we reaffirmed those gender binaries. But the, mm -hmm. the interesting thing from that is even, even the, the less supportive statement in which we talked about it doesn't matter what their gender is, was still had a, a, a majority of support from people. And mm -hmm. so I think that's where we need to sometimes sacrifice the most effective message for the message that still tells a progressive story. Because what's clear from that, and especially once you then start to look at how the opposition was much more favourable of the message in which we talked about men and women, um, our recommendation from that is go with a more gender neutral mm -hmm. way of talking about it. Because you already, you still have the majority of people. And if we want to strengthen uh, that way of thinking about the world, then we need to be saying it more and, yeah. it comes, and and those frames get strengthened with repetition so mm. uh, it, it does become one of those things where we shouldn't just automatically test everything and say well what worked on most people and then say well then that's the right message for us mm. and that, it's never the approach that we take and uh, it's um i think exactly on issues like this this is why mm. it's really so the other method yeah. is if you get it one worked on enough people that it still could be impactful and it's a more progressive message um, yeah. yeah. So we had about 62% of persuadables who agreed with that statement when it was yeah. framed in terms of it doesn't matter what the gender is. That rose to 83% once we made it about boys and men, oh, sorry, women and men as role models. Mm -hmm. um, but still 62% is, is, is a good majority. Um, and then you've got the 78% of supporters who already agree with it and combined it, it equals yeah. a decent chunk of the population. So it's a, it's a winning message. Mm. Um, it's not as universally accepted, but what's the point of just saying things that don't actually... But are universally accepted. We're not changing anything, exactly. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, before we go, is there any final, I was thinking, you know, positive message we can end on um, around, you know, there was a question, for example, around what what is the new ideas of masculinity that we want everyone to learn? Or what do you think this this looks like in a in a world where some of these messages become universally accepted? I mean, for me, I, I don't want to be too, um, uh, I, don't, I don't want to have, you know, purely rose-coloured glasses. I don't want to be too optimistic about the, um, about the data we've described, but it certainly does show that there's, you know, I think a, an encouraging degree of support for opening up um, notions of masculinity and opening up gender roles, you know, particularly when it's framed in terms of men's health and well-being, less so when it's framed in more explicitly ethical, ethical and political terms or in terms of violence and so on. But there's still some degree of support. And I'm still just gobsmacked at how much framing matters. Mm. That framing messages in positive and progressive ways attracts a degree of support that just, um, you know, declines radically when you frame um, messages in much more backlash ways. So I think there are some encouraging messages about the ways we can continue to... Um, uh, inspire the kind of progressive change. It's uneven, but the, the uneven but progressive change that we do see in Australian society. Yeah, great. Mark, final thoughts? 
just just re-emphasize what we were talking about towards the beginning and just um, the fact that we had to go back to the data and push even harder to to to, to get that refined opposition that that couldn't be persuaded i mean that's i really didn't expect that going into this i thought it would be a much harder job to persuade people but um for, on a more from a more personal perspective i'm also not surprised that the messages we ended up with were effective because for me i mean michael's had, had the benefit of, of studying gender and, and and gender equality and masculinity for for yonks now and for me it's a it's a it's a newer topic area for us to explore in our research um, but the way that i personally felt as i progressed through this research and talking to lots of people men and women about masculinity and coming to realizations myself about how i mean i wouldn't consider myself someone who would be normally strongly held by these stereotypes but it was i genuinely felt a sense of freeing um, in having these conversations and just talking about it and unpacking it with people um, and if that's the feeling that we're generating in people when we invite them to think about it from this different perspective um, then it shouldn't be surprising that it works so well because who doesn't want to have that sort of that sort of lifting feeling of that burden taken off us and I think um, I think it's just there's so much potential for this um, to to really to really shift attitudes and uh, and, and shift behaviors as a result of that as well well that's a lovely way to end to encourage us all to, to continue having these conversations um, I'd encourage you all to look at the Vic Health website in um, vichealth.vic.gov.au forward slash breaking stereotypes and there you'll find the Framing Masculinities Guide as well as um, the report Masculinities and Health Attitudes Towards Men and Masculinities in Australia. So thanks for listening and for your huge amount of interest um, in this topic and hope to see you again soon. Thank you everybody. Bye. Thank you.